Welcome to the Breakpoint Recap Show. I am Gil Gross, joined by my co-host, as always, Alex Gruskin. We have broken down the first five episodes of the new tennis Netflix docuseries, Breakpoint In Depth. And then we talked to Taylor Fritz, the current world number five. Then we talked to Brian Koppelman, lifelong tennis fan and showrunner, co-creator, executive producer of Billions on Showtime. Now we are uh, taking a sharp left turn. Uh, we are speaking to my childhood friend who also works in TV as a locations man. But unlike Taylor Fritz, unlike Brian Koppelman, my friend Joe Avitanta uh, is not a tennis guy. And this was his introduction to tennis. So we're getting a new perspective on someone who was introduced to many of these people without having ever heard of them before through Breakpoint the show. He was delightful as a guest, and clearly there's something in that Westchester water, all of you getting into TV, but no, I mean, it was great to get the chance to chat with Joe. I apologize. I had to duck, uh, duck out early for a broadcast, and I'm upset I didn't get to be there for the full time because Joe offers insight, enthusiasm, not just for television more broadly, but for this show in particular. I think he is the sort of fan the show was targeting to have be compelled with the sport and it's clear there were things that stuck with him there it was also clear there are things he thinks the show can continue to do to retain his interest it's a fascinating conversation that i know everyone's going to enjoy and here it is my friend joe thank you for coming on you are not the world number five in tennis how do you feel that we've gone from taylor fritz to you it's uh, all up from here i mean <laughs> Honestly, I, I've heard you guys say that maybe Fritz is a great face for American tennis. Maybe he's not. I think he's perfect. But who better than me to <laughs> come in and kind of brave American tennis forward? Yeah, and let's just address the elephant in the room. I'll tell you this. You look better than he did on his video. Like, we couldn't see him at all. At least we can see your outline. And it's a gorgeous outline, Joe. I appreciate you taking the time to join us. I'm always curious, what are Gil's... What's the perception of Gil in relation to the tennis world in the minds of his non-tennis friends? This is always a fascinating question for me. So I don't know if you've heard much about Gil's past and origins and beginnings in podcasting, but when we were in high school, Gil had a show okay, called Keeping Score. And if you ask many people from our hometown, they will call him Gil Gross from Keeping Score. Really? <laughs> now we're talking. And by the way, at the end, when you guys do rapid fire, if we have rapid fire today, uh, that's going to be renamed in honor of keeping score to Gil's rapid fire section, which was called quick takes. <laughs> <laughs> so he was he lacked the creativity even in the high school years. That's good to know. Yeah, he was floundering. out there. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's awesome. Hey, well, look, Joe told me that he actually listened to the first three episodes of our podcast and. I, I assure you, it is the first time he has ever listened to my stuff. <laughs> I mean, we we know that. We know that. Yeah. I think I think he, you know, he once said, like, dude, I talk to you every day. There's no <laughs> way I'm downloading your shit yeah. on Spotify. <laughs> All right. Um, when you're getting it for free, why why go and listen to the ad breaks? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Joe, let's let's start here um, with the most basic question. I could possibly ask you about Breakpoint, episodes one through five. Uh, did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it very much. Uh, as Gil knows, and as your listenership is about to, I've never had a distaste for tennis. I find it interesting visually, a ball bouncing back and forth and such. I know exactly as much about tennis as I would need to, to know who Daniil Medvedev is. Don't know anyone worse than Medvedev. <laughs> okay. But... I found this incredibly interesting. They made tennis make sense to me. I knew there were games and sets and matches and all of this, but now I see like, oh, you know, Rude is down to none. The, or to love, sorry, Alex. Um, <laughs> you don't have to apologize to me, but carry <laughs> on. You know, Rude is down to love against Nadal on clay. This isn't going to go well for him. I, I'm starting to get a little more of a grasp for the sport. And I tested it out. Last week, I had a meeting at a tennis club for work, and Rublev was playing in the Dubai Open or Invitational or whatever it's called. 
Uh, and I sat down and I watched me some Rublev and I texted Gil and I was like, I'm enjoying this. I like this Rublev guy. He seems angry and fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting to hear you say all of those things and talk about having a meeting at a tennis club, because I think where I want to follow up on this, on the liking it aspect, and we can unpack that in a second, but the idea of, did it inspire you to either a watch as it sounds like it did, but also b play the sport? Like I'm curious watching it. If what, which sort of motivational feelings it arouses. That is a great question, Alex, that Gil knowing me for many, many years would not have asked because <laughs> Gil is well aware that coordination is not my friend <laughs> and me angling a tennis racket correctly to hit the ball square on it. It's going to take a thousand tries for me to get it. Sure. But as a, an avid sports watcher, you will, you will catch me watching the next French open, which I believe is in June. Last week of May, first week of June, it counts. Count it. Very good. We'll count it. I missed the Aussie open by a couple of weeks in my discovery of tennis, but I'll be watching the majors. I'll be watching my, my champs at Indian Wells, go for it. Uh, and, <laughs> Gil has asked me to come with him for years and years and years. And finally this year, I will attend the U.S. Open. Wow. I know. Round of applause for me. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll just add that Joe, Joe is the last pick, Gruskin. He was always <laughs> the last pick. Uh, <laughs> we, Very true. we wanted to kind of talk about what episodes really worked and what episodes were the best. And that will also kind of inform our discussion. Uh, I made my opinion very, very known uh, in the episode five podcast that I felt like that was the best one. And I, I almost feel like I got Gruskin to agree with me by the end of us recording that episode. Uh, Joe, which one did you think was the best? Uh, I think it's episode three and it's not close. Taylor Fritz, Indian Wells. Taylor Fritz and Maria Sakari. Maria Sakari. Each of these episodes were following one or two people. And if you go to episode two, if you go to episode four, episode five, it feels to me like there is a disconnect in the way that the show, like the narrative of each episode comes together for at least one of the stars, that one outshines the other. And I thought that Fritz and Sakari both had really compelling runs at Indian Wells in terms of a just sports aspect of it. And they're both immense stars in the making. I, I had seen one soccer match before I'd watched this show. Probably couldn't have told you her name. Fritz <laughs> I had never heard of. And I come out of this, and those are two of my four favorites that I think I saw in this series. Uh, it... and Well, no, please. No, 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 please carry on. Uh, and what drives that one home for me is that this whole show, my, I'm a little bit spoiling our later discussions here, but my one issue with the show is that it paints every single player as purely having a, a mental barrier to winning when I, I'm kind of yelling at the screen, like, doesn't it matter if you're good at tennis? <laughs> <laughs> it feels like it should matter. Like how, like, well, you hit the ball. Are you good on clay? Are you good on hard court? Uh, that episode I thought had the best, uh, it, it best portrayed the mental struggle of playing tennis in ways that we weren't seeing before. You know, I can look at Matteo Berrettini struggles because maybe he's more afraid of losing than he loves winning. And that's not going to do it for me. I'm sorry that those feel like things that we say about Tom Brady when he loses in the Super Bowl. And I'm like, I don't, I don't need to analyze Brady's drive to win. Uh, that's how I thought about Berrettini. I love playing too nice. That's great. That's really compelling. I can't see it on the court. Uh with Sakari having moments be too like throwing herself into the semifinal too much, being emotionally drained, doesn't have it, is distracted, perhaps is just depleted for the final and mentally isn't there. That is fascinating. We can see that in real time. And Fritz overcoming an injury is the same thing. But what drives this episode home is the entire five episodes, what they're telling you every episode is that every player but one loses. And that is a nothing statement. That means nothing to me. You won some games. You won more than you lost for a lot of these people. But you have Sakari losing it in the final and sitting on the lovely Perrier green bench, looking off thousand yard stare, just looking dead, towel over her shoulders. And you can see the life leaving her body. 
they're now interviewing someone else, they're celebrating someone else, right? And you really feel for Sakari there. And you think like, oh, this is what it feels like. This is the feeling. And it's driven home and it's perfect when they bring in the final of the men's and Fritz beats Nadal. Nadal, who's the big bad wolf of the entire series. Mm -hmm. Everyone is terrified of him. I mean, he does warm-ups and psychs out two people in the finale. Uh, But in the Fritz match, Fritz wins, and then we see the exact same shot of Nadal on the Perrier green bench, despondent. And that's when it hits for me, oh, Nadal isn't mentally superior to these people. He goes through the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I thought that episode was perfect. Well, it's so fascinating to hear you point to that episode in particular. And it's funny, I was going to ask you about the fact that both Fritz, Sakari go the distance in the event, how that impacts the storyline. And you do have that dichotomy of what it means to get through that finish line, what it means to get all the way there, but come up short. And yet the the the, the thing I grasp to there most of everything you said is just that idea that like, what happens in the first round? What happens in the second round? You're, you kind of don't really care about that, it sounds like. And, you know, again, if you're stuck in the tennis bubble, you know that's the meat and potato of any event. Like, the real results, the most significant results happen those first few days. Championship weekend is the cherry on top. And yet, like, I, I wonder how compelling those first few rounds is. How Part of the reason I think the, the other episodes might have struggled in comparison to three is – you got the chance to see the full roller coaster ride that is going from start to finish in an event. What again? I know you you kind of alluded to this already, Joe. But was that one of the things that you know, being a, a player who loses, or like Felix in the final episode, right? He loses to Nadal, but it's a fourth round loss. Is that story not as compelling? Uh, I would, I would say that yes. The uh, the fact that they both lost in the final, Sakari and Fritz, makes it far more compelling. But they both more made so the, because made the final. Yeah. Yes. 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 Uh, I find that what that actually is is that I can't tell sometimes with the show if we're following players uh, in an isolated episode, if we're following players yes. across a season, sure, uh, or if we're following the tournament. And so I really loved that I got. I didn't get all of Indian Wells. I'm sure there were some great storylines that were left down for time, and you know that's a whole other discussion. But that I I felt some closure on the tournament, which it's not a requirement, of course. You know, I really enjoyed the Curios episode. That guy's out in the second round. Yeah. Uh, but there is an element that's like the fact that we can get all the way to the end and see the completion of this run and the dichotomy of losing the final, winning the final. Uh, I think is it's it's bonus points for episode three. Mm-hmm. That's fascinating. I swear, Gil, I'm going to let you talk, but you can call Joe in your spare time. This is this is our <laughs> moment for me and Joe. Um, it's just, and I, by the way, I'm sure you've seen that look of disgust from Gil's face that I'm getting from him right now. But that's many, fascinating. Many times, <laughs> yes. That word you used, closure. Did you feel like some episodes you didn't get closure on storylines? No. Uh, okay. Or sorry, yes, I did not. Uh, okay. I mean, I felt like the Australian Open episode, the second one. It's heavily implied that Nadal wins, Mm -hmm. but I don't see it. And thus, see, for y'all, you guys are watching this and you're like, these are interesting vignettes from tournaments that I watched. I did not watch the Australian Open. I, to be honest, for a moment, even knowing what I know about TV, thought to myself, did they shoot this in January and get it out this fast? And this is the 2023 Australian Open? And then I saw the Djokovic thing and I remembered that. but, you know, if we're following the Australian Open, can we at least get a little thing at the end saying, like, by the way, Nadal won? Like, can, <laughs> yeah. I, at least, can I at least get that? The after credits, just like yeah. also well, Rafa went on to win. Right. They, yeah. they did it. They did it on episode two. The Australian Open was a little bit different from the others because sure. they did like episode one was like, forward. yeah, it was the Nick Kyrgios episode. Episode two was like, let's go back in time and do this all over again with Tamjanovic and and Berrettini. Uh, I, I find it fascinating, though, that that the whole mental thread, which was one of the real the, definitely the common themes throughout the five episodes was. Let's get into Yo, the being a tennis is not important. Player. Being good at tennis is not important. It's all about mental. <laughs> no, I mean you. You heard if you, me. If you put if you put me out there, I would be so mentally ready that I would destroy the Australian Open. <laughs> yeah, look, you I'm heard, the king of clay. 
<laughs> you heard me with the with the same the same complaint when Berrettini lost to Nadal, for example, in that Australian Open semifinal. Like you would have thought it was you would have thought there were no issues with the tennis matchup there. That exactly. like Matteo just had a, a a mental kind of kind of uh, resurgence in the third set, and then he won the third set, and then he mentally dipped. It's like okay, yeah, I think that's a a really uh, interesting complaint, and I. I I connected with that as well, even from my perspective. And then with Maria Sakari, it feels more real because honestly, it is very mental for her. She yeah. should she should have more than one title that she won in 2018. Like she's better than that. Her abilities are better than that. So it is very mental with her. Uh, d- first of all, quickly, Gruskin, uh, did did Joe convince you that episode three was the best? Like, what is your answer to that question? I don't know. I they were all. Yeah equal shades i'll tell you which i can tell you which ones weren't the best i don't know i mean again like they let's were all do that let's yeah do i that. guess i guess it's more similar it's just to to joe's point and i think it's it's a good one the idea that what was every episode covering were you covering a tournament and these were the two most relevant players we were filming at this tournament or were you trying to tell the story of a player and using the results in that tournament to be you know, again, the can I answer this question? Can I can I answer please. that question? Yeah, they were they were covering players. They were not covering the tournament. Like that was abundantly clear. I know, but isn't that a bummer? <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe. So is it a bummer? That's what I would return to you, Joe. And it gets back to the central thread of did they talk enough about the tennis itself? Like, you know, again, I was watching season five of Drive to Survive, the F one equivalent. I know it just came out, and they d- were doing a whole thing on porpoising, and they were explaining car bump up down porpoise porpoise. And it's like if they would have come out there with Paul Anacone's voice and gone, the two handed backhand was first revolutionized by Bjorn Borg. That's not Paul why is, Anacone's why voice. Why is Paul but, British? Yeah, all of a sudden, wrong, wrong name, but it's just like that's the two handed backhand. By the way, Bjorn Paul Borg Anacone. Didn't. Sorry to interrupt, but Paul Anacone, one of the best characters we got in this by far. I agree. Very good one, which is why his name came into mind, even if his accent didn't. Um, but, like, do you want more of that as a casual fan? Absolutely. Like, okay, where uh, would it have been most effective? I think you can sprinkle some in in every episode okay. when we get into every player. They try to do it. They really do. Um, when I was just watching, I watched King of Clay a couple of days ago. And Tony Nadal is talking about how strong uh, FAA's forehand is. Mm-hmm. FAA being Felix, two last names I can't pronounce. Um, Look at you, though. You know the acronyms. Oh, oh! I did some research. I found out that he's <laughs> dating uh, Isla Tamjanovic's cousin. Yeah. And that's a fun thing. And people yeah. were referring to him as FAA. Um, but what I, uh, what I found with that is, so Tony Nadal is describing what drew him to FAA uh, such a strong forehand, but I can I can do two minutes on that. I don't need just Tony Nadal subtitled, a man who I through this episode grow to not respect. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think we can do a little more if we have Berrettini, and I don't. You guys know more about Berrettini's play, and Berrettini is really good at one thing. Then let's do two minutes on that. They kind of do it with Ons in episode four, where they show that Ons kind of plays similarly to Curios with the trick shots. I mean, those drop shots that Anz is dropping, like, oh, my God. Oh, she's (laughs) dropping them. Oh, she's dropping them. All right. Giddy up. Um, But, yeah, I mean, Anz, an incredible player to watch, and I'm glad they gave us a couple minutes on that. But I think that there's more to tell me about Bedosa as a player than that Bedosa was a junior champion. I want to know about Bedosa on the court. Because I've been watching Bedosa for two of these four episodes and thinking that woman is not even close to as good as Sakari. That woman is not even close to as good as Isla. I want them to win. Get out of here, Bedosa. I agree. Uh, Drive to Survive explains aspects of Formula One racing. Breakpoint does not really make a big effort to explain any intricacies in the sport of tennis. Um, it, it's, yet. 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 Um, yeah. It's more about the storytelling. You, you were, uh, before we got sidetracked, I just want to give, give you a chance to loop back, Gruskin. You, you were saying, I know which episodes didn't work. Well, it was more of as the story progressed, like, I think they didn't do enough with the Nick Kyrgios story storyline. And I think there are specific episodes. So why episode five, episode three, which I think are the two nominees for best episode work so well, is you have a little conflict. And 
the rest of the episodes are extraordinarily conflict averse. And I was curious if you felt that way, Joe, because like episode two, the conflict is Isla versus Mateo go go to the boardroom to do your tennis hit. Like I want to sleep in a little later. That's pretty much the extent of the conflict. Now to your points from earlier, the overlaying conflict of every episode is player versus self. Like you're right. They very much made that like the, look, you got to compete with yourself to get through the mental hurdles, the physical hurdles, et cetera. You always had that central theme, but in terms of player player specific conflict or player versus coach specific conflict whatever you actually get some meat on the bone something to disagree about in how you feel about how Tony Nadal handled Felix's match versus uh Rafa or you know to the to the Indian Wells conflict point Taylor gets injured it's a significant inflection point there is some him versus team of Taylor, big picture, don't risk it versus him saying, fuck that. I'm in the finals of Indian Wells. I'm playing this match. And I By guess the way, what which I-, I thought was, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but I thought that was preposterous that you're going to pull him out in the final. I was watching with a friend of mine and we were both <laughs> yelling at the TV, like, Paul, you've coached champions. How are you like <laughs> at a loss here trying to convince this guy to not play the final? You play the final. Yeah. You play the final. Sorry, continue. No, that's well, it gets me to a question I want to ask you is was the show too conflict averse? Like, did you feel it was a little too rosy? Uh, I mean, I didn't when I first watched it. And then I, the biggest takeaway from that was that I want, listened to y'all's episode on Curios on the Maverick. There is so much Curios that I did not know from that episode. And my, both my praise and my complaint about that episode is that it doesn't feel connected to the rest of the series at all. It feels yeah. like, uh, a mini 30 for 30 they made about Nick Kyrgios at the Australian Open. Yeah. And that's great. I loved watching a 50-minute documentary about Nick Kyrgios. What a fascinating gentleman. He is, to quote himself, a different cat. Uh, and I really enjoyed that. But seeing that this dark side that he has is something that people are concerned about and talk about, and that there are, like, the even just the fines that when he's screaming obscenities at the line judge that that actually matters. I mean, someone mentioned at one point in the show that there's a penalty for breaking your racket. He didn't seem to mind taking that penalty. <laughs> uh, and like hearing about the actual nuance of Curios, yes, I thought it was incredibly conflict diverse. Uh, but my only complaint about episode five, although you do have that we're on clay, you know, and FAA and Rude both have their shot and they don't hit, uh, I think that, yes, that aspect is great, but the failure of that episode is to no fault of Netflix and to no fault of these players is that the final wasn't close, and now we can't tie up this rude narrative. Hmm. It it feels impossible to end that episode on a note. The only way that I can look at it in a way that's, that's narratively satisfying for this chunk of five episodes is Nadav's still the king, and you are never going to get him. You know what I mean? That... Yeah. Uh, Nadal, every he is a looming specter in every episode. He's terrifying, <laughs> and it, he scares the shit out of FAA and Rude just by doing the warm ups. And by the way, I'm watching this whole episode thinking maybe Rude's got a leg up mentally. I know this shows maybe only think about tennis mentally, uh, right. but if we're going to do the this sport is mental argument, Rude's camp seems to have much more joy. They're having fun with the tennis more. It feels like. Sakari's camp is that as well. Uh, but I'm like, I'm watching it and I'm thinking maybe Rude has a chance here as being more of a positive person with this. Mm-hmm. And to see that not come together, to see nothing come of that, because he also couldn't handle watching Nadal's warm-ups, to that, that left me a little, a little wanting. Well, to that end, and unfortunately, I'm probably going to have to vacate this episode uh, after <laughs> this question because- Sorry again- to have chased you out. <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. We found a nat- more natural co-host. This is fine. Again, Gil <laughs> is the Tony Nadal in this scenario, and he goes with his longtime uh, <laughs> friend here and Joe over his recent charge in Alex. But my last con- uh, question to you, it's a silly one, but you bring up that fifth episode. Here's the case for it being the best episode in the nutshell. And Nadal's just freaking going side to side, and you're just like, oh, my God. Like, if you're going to make the mental – side of this game the entire theme of the first five episodes can you imagine staring down that fucking gauntlet where you have him 
shuffling side to side. You're like, dude, I kind of want to stretch too. Do you mind if I take this part of the hall? Oh, and he's like, nope. And then you have Djokovic on the huge poster staring them down in that hallway as well. Like, I think that's the single most powerful scene we got in the first five episodes. I'm curious if you felt that way. Uh, I did for the rude section. For FAA, it's it's an interesting thing to see Nadal eating up all the space. Yeah. But for rude, the shot holds for so much longer. And you see that Nadal is looking straight ahead. Mm-hmm. Granted, Nadal is totally aware that Rude is in the room and this is a mind game. And he, he's aware of all of this. But he pretends he's a good actor. He's <laughs> portraying... <laughs> He's portraying that he's just warming up in the hall, just minding his own business, just being an intense little guy. Uh, But Rude, you can see him. He keeps glancing and pretending that he's not at Nadal. And he's so distracted and so eaten by it. And you can see there's a a great moment where Rafa starts, I mean, the video people who watch this will see what I'm doing. It's great podcasting right here. Uh, (laughs) Nadal is, I guess, like practice swinging, just like getting his arms loose. And you can see Rude do little tiny motions that mirror him. Yeah. That mm-hmm. Nadal has literally gotten in his head. Mm-hmm. And Rude can now not move his arms without thinking of Nadal. So yes, I thought that was incredibly powerful and really drives home how much of, as I call him, the big bad wolf Nadal is to these players. Uh, it's so funny. I was having, um, I was having some dinner with uh, Noah Eagle. He said the same thing. He said, Felix was fine. I thought, you know, the warm up, it looked like it didn't get to Felix. Rude, it destroyed. It yeah. absolutely destroyed Casper Rude, clearly. Uh, this show, I mean, what was exciting about this show, Joe, is that tennis media struggles for access. And what happened in F1 was the walls were stripped down, and the access that was granted to Netflix was, was unprecedented. And I, I thought any moment like that where it's like, oh, we're actually seeing the players in the hallway where we don't normally see them. Netflix is in a room w- that we don't usually get to see. Uh, that That is the point of the show. Like that is what we hope we get from the show. So uh, good conversation. Gruskin, you got to go? I do indeed. Thank you for doing this, Joe. I tolerate all of his nonsense, please. Keep him in, keep him in line. Oh, will do. I'll, uh, I'll carry the torch for you, Alex. I appreciate it. Just hearkening back to the discussion of access, when y'all were discussing the Curios episode and that there was an altercation in the doubles final with uh, the two com- com- competing teams in the doubles final. Yeah. Uh, and the two of you wondered, do we think Netflix was in the room? Do we think they had access? I'd wager a guess. I would say 100% they're in the room. I would wager 100% they don't want to air that because I'd wager Nick Curio said some pretty awful shit. <laughs> you know, uh, I I can't. No, none of us can speak to it. None of yeah, us were there. Right. But I, if I know anything about Curios, I don't think he was like taking the high road. And maybe that ruins the narrative of the, of the episode. I think that's very feasible. I will say that. <laughs> very feasible. Um that brings me to the golf thing. Um, I'm three episodes into full swing and it's been fascinating to see the difference in access between breakpoint and full swing. I know that you haven't, uh, you haven't gotten to the golf, uh, but the cameras, for example, uh, there's a Brooks Kepka episode. All right. And part of that episode, actually a, a decent chunk of it is at Brooks Kepka's home with his wife. And it's like, this is where Brooks Kepka lives. This is his house. <laughs> They're hanging out. He's with his wife. Uh, another part is with Ian Poulter. And there's a lot of footage of Ian Poulter on the private jet going from venue to venue. Oh, cool. They're on the PJ. I want to see that. And it just made me think, wait a second. We didn't get to see Paula Bedos's house in Madrid. Uh, I don't even know if she has one, to be very clear. But like, we, we weren't in any players' homes. We weren't on any private jets. Uh, and and that to me we were on we were on a private jet we were we were on we were on Curios's private jet i this is one of the oh, things we i was were. thinking when listening to y'all's episode about it it's the best character introduction for nick Curios of all time that it's him and costine on the jet and he's taking a video and he says pilot give me a thumbs up and my friend i was watching with we discussed this ad nauseum just that little moment that nick Curios is very charming and he is going to have a little moment with this pilot. He's also not going to know the pilot's name. And he's going to be like, hey, all positive pilot, give me some love. He's distracting the pilot from his job. But 
he's showing the pilot some love, but he doesn't know the pilot's name. And it's just like the lovely enigma of a man uh, as singular as Nick Kyrgios. But yes, continue. Yeah, there's there's nuance there. So that was one of the one of the observations of uh, of differences that I noticed in the golf. Uh, they were also very very lucky with the live thing. Like sometimes this is just about timing, and shows that hit it big. Like Drive to Survive had the pandemic. Uh, the the Michael Jordan the Last Dance had the pandemic. Uh, golf now has the live. It doesn't feel like tennis has that. Like wow, incredible. Like look look how that worked out for you um and in that way maybe something will happen uh the Djokovic thing they probably didn't take uh good enough advantage of for whatever reason uh because that was a big deal like that was a story that cracked the mainstream and I knew about it yeah and it was <laughs> not it was not a big deal in in the docuseries I mean it opens the episode of episode two I believe it is and we we get a little Australian government fun time but uh what I the biggest takeaway that I thought of that is outside of brief mentions, quick little montage shots, and that section of the Djokovic denied access to Australia due to lack of vaccination. Um, we don't see him. He is not at any of these tournaments, or if he is, he's not featured. Perhaps Novak declined to be in front of cameras. Perhaps he was incredibly boring in front of cameras. Who's to say? But the point is, we went into this. And there wasn't two villains. We didn't see Serena. Uh, I don't know if Federer had retired yet at this point. I would wager he had not. But we see one villain. And it makes for a much better story to have just Nadal be the guy. And Nadal's in almost every episode. But the downside there is that my brain, who is now, you know, uh, a blossoming tennis fan, budding, eager to watch sets and serves and all the whatnot, uh, I have so little awareness of Novak Djokovic now. He is receding from my memory as Rude takes his place. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, part of it, I think, is just the fact... Okay, so first of all, Djokovic, because of the vaccination stance, yes, he didn't play the Australian Open. That was made clear. But then he also didn't get to play Indian Wells because the United States uh, was not going to uh, allow him to cross the border either. Uh, he did play in Madrid... And like if if they went with Alcaraz, there was a big Djokovic Alcaraz match in Madrid that could have crazy that we haven't seen more Alcaraz yet. That guy yeah. seems fascinating. Yeah, and, and we will. Uh we will in the next batch. I know that for a fact. And we'll see Francis Tiafo in the next batch, which will should also be a lot of fun. Uh but yeah, it, that's true because he was a, a major storyline first half of last year, which just, whoa, new guy, new guy on the block. And and you didn't get that either. And that's why the the idea that the the docu series was going to have kind of this 360 de degree view of the tennis tour just couldn't be further off it's not what they were doing it's not what they were attempting and i, I don't know if it would have been better if they took that approach because at the end of the day we're not looking for like a overview surface level kind of summary of what's happening tournament speak to tournament. for yourself i would love that really okay this is good make well, the argument for that my my complaint uh and look i mean this is all about expectation right that if i had gone into the show knowing that i'm going to see very interesting tennis stories about the psychology of tennis players and how that materializes in real matches that have occurred then this show is perfect they would have nailed that but I thought it was Drive to Survive for Tennis, and everyone thought it was Drive to Survive for Tennis. And we all thought that we'd be following a season-long exploit of these players and these tournaments, and maybe seeing these tournaments as living things themselves. You know, it's not just a difference of clay or hardcore or grass. There is an energy to each one that's different. And that's something really fun to me as someone who's now becoming interested in tennis. Uh, but seeing it this way, it's fine. It's just an issue of expectation. And personally, my biggest complaint is that when I finished the show, I looked up the real rankings and I saw, you know, it's disappointed that Paula Bedosa is now number 19. You know, some of these things are bombers that uh, that Rude is ranked ahead of FAA, even though I felt like FAA was kind of the lead man of that episode. Uh, and, you know, looking at all these things that, you know, Nadal is six now, even though he started so hot at the beginning of last year. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, what has happened to my guy Nadal? But the biggest thing is, I look at the women's rankings. Who is Sabalenka? <laughs> I've never heard of this woman. You know, I want to see the top five out there. And I know we can't get Novak if he's not playing there or if he doesn't agree. And season two, if this show's a hit, they'll have way more access. Everyone's going to want to do it. It's the same thing that happened to Drive to Survive. You get, was it was it Hamilton that was the holdout after season one? Yeah. Hamilton yeah, you was get, not in it. Yeah, you get Hamilton wanting to be in, in it now, you know? Totally. And I'm hoping that we get Novak and that we get, um struggling to think of tennis players. But, uh, oh, there's the uh, American woman. Uh Goff, Pagula, uh, Goff, yeah, the, Goff. Both of them. Pagula is in like one scene. I don't know if she wasn't good yet or something. I don't know, but we have an American right here in. I believe that was the final or the semifinal. Yeah, and I I know nothing about this woman. Yeah, Coco should be featured. Uh, Pagula's fascinating. It, do you know the Pagulas? Like, do you know who her family is? Know, do they own a sports team? Yeah, they own the Bills and the Sabres. That's the Bills, okay. Yeah. Wait, like, so she's that Pagula? That's wild. She's she's their daughter. She is Terry Pagula and uh, <laughs> I'm forgetting the yeah, I'm forgetting the mother's name, uh, who's actually who wasn't in good health, uh, or is is not good in, in good in great health still, um, unfortunately. And Pagula, uh, Jessica, uh, just published a great piece in the Players Tribune talking about the struggles that she was going through on the tour last year, having to deal with her family situation and play at the same time. So uh, she would be fascinating. But okay, what you just said is is definitely like a an aha moment for me because you would like to actually be able to watch this show and understand everything that happened on the tour. Yeah, I with, basically... Which, like, my perfect version of this is give me an episode for let's say the 10 biggest tournaments. You know, I want my, my four grand slams. I want Indian Wells. I don't know. It felt like Madrid was like an insignificant tournament. Like no one cared, but you would know better than me, Uh, but give me the 10 biggest ones and give me the six best players in the world. Uh, Actually. No, we have, we have men and women. So I guess give me, give me four men and four women who are the best in the world. And give me uh, one rising star, one man, one woman, you know, so I can follow the I'm, you know, the 20 year old pro who's trying to get from number 39 to number 30, hopefully this year. And I also want to follow that it's Medvedev Nadal in the final. And I know who both these guys are. And they're the biggest stars in the sport. This has been used as a star making opportunity. It's been attempted to be used as a star making opportunity. Some episodes I believe fail at that, which I can tell you about all, all about later. Um, but use it to claim your current stars as stars. Make Tsitsipas an international celebrity more than he is now. I'm sure now he's a European celebrity with some niche tennis celeb around the world. But I don't know who this Tsitsipas guy is. Seems pretty young and he's got long hair and a mustache. Maybe he's funny. You know, give me more Tsitsipas. He is funny in a very unique way. Uh, I okay. Who? What didn't work? Who didn't work? I'm not part of the tennis media, so I'll just say it. Um, I found Kyrgios fascinating. After hearing the two of you talk about it, I would have preferred to get a fuller picture of Kyrgios, but you know we can't always get what we want. Um, Ila Tomjanovic, great character, great character. I had a little bit of an element of. Isla is like the lowest ranked player in this series by far. And accurate. Maybe Isla is not good enough for me to now be a fan of, but I wouldn't know. Is the 26th best player in the world? Like, is that someone I should know? I don't know. Um, but I found Matteo Berrettini to be awful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like the man's gorgeous, but that guy he was giving me nothing. He was just like a little bit rude to his girlfriend who had been nothing but lovely the entire episode. Uh, and yeah, I'm getting nothing. I don't know anything about his play style. All I know is he's like a jacked, handsome Italian guy with a hilarious family. That's all I've got on him. And we go to episode three, you give me Fritz, who has a little bit of like a surfer boy. He almost feels like if we made a biopic about him, Adrian Grenier would play him, which might mean nothing to the tennis audience, but it's the entourage guy. Um, there's something like, kind of like laughing by accident, like carefree about him, but then he's a dialed in tennis star and that's fascinating. Sakari, 
you're seeing some really sweet moments with her and her coach, who's a very young guy, and they seem to have a real friendship, and they're drinking espressos, and it's great. They're having a nice time. And you also really feel for her and the losses. Anz Jabor is fascinating and a fascinating player to watch. But Dosa has got an incredible story. And then we get to the finale, and I like Rude's vibe, but I don't think I really know that much about him now. All I know is that his dad's his coach, and that feels like – after watching this, it feels like everyone's dad's their coach, you know? <laughs> yeah. This is a whole family affair. Um, and I'm watching uh, FAA, who at the start, I'm shown, is this like the the wonder kid for all of tennis? Is he the next one? No, it's all for us. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm being shown FAA, and I'm getting excited about this guy. He seems young, charming, very talented. And then his personality just kind of flatlines, and he loses. So now I have nothing for FAA. Do you know what I mean? So I thought that we had some really successful star makings for Fritz, for Kyrgios, for Sakri, for Ons. Uh, Some, you know, Bedosa and for FAA and Rude, I thought it was solid. But Berrettini, oh, what a whiff by uh, by the Breakpoint producers. Sorry, Breakpoint producers. Uh, You know, if you ever need people to work on your crew. Um, (laughs) but, (laughs) But, you know... I, I would have wanted more out of him. If we're going to paint this like gorgeous tennis love story, show me the love. All I'm getting is get your ass in the business center. And honestly, I wanted to throw Berrettini in the business center after that episode. God, not, not my kind of guy. All right. All right. Berrettini to the business center. <laughs> uh, that's, sorry, sorry, Mateo. <laughs> that's interesting to hear. Two more things. So we don't have a lot of information about, ratings and stuff like that because no. that's how that's netflix how ne- would never netflix. release it yeah exactly so you never get this stuff from netflix the only data point you do get from netflix is the top 10 in any given country <laughs> which breakpoint never appeared in full swing has appeared in the top 10 it's been top 10 all week uh which, which to is be fair to breakpoint i did see that it was in top searches so very good people were looking for it they just didn't watch it <laughs> Any sense in your circle, and and I should have said, and you've alluded to it, I should have said it at the top, you do work in TV, uh, locations, locations, locations. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I'm sure I'm sure a lot of people are are chatting, chatting at the water cooler. Uh, wh- do you have any sense of Breakpoint and like its mainstream breakthrough? Gil, I have some terrible news for you. Uh, you and uh, I just added another person, the lovely Alex Gruskin, who I met today. So sorry, I had to go. You two are the only two people I know who watch the show. Uh, yes, that is incredibly anecdotal. And yes, yep. I work in scripted television and it's not the same thing. And they don't watch the same things. And people work 12 hour days and don't watch TV at all. But it is one of those things where tennis is, you know, its own niche situation. I know it's an incredibly massive sport, but it's not the NFL. Uh, and if it's going to break through, it kind of needs to be like drive to survive or drive to survive after season one, wasn't the biggest thing in the world. It was, have you heard about the show drive to survive? And then Netflix puts a big media uh, blow behind it for season two and for three and for four. Uh, and then it grows from there. So I would not be surprised if this is a huge tennis world hit that then gives Netflix the confidence to really throw more behind it for season two, which I would love to see happen. Yeah, that would be great. My only concern with that is people in the tennis world have, have their, their opinions. And in some ways it's very difficult to please people in the tennis world when they are, when you are making a a docu-series about something that they have already lived through and, you know, part of, I think watching something like that, which is nonfiction is you're learning and there's a limit to how much someone like Gruskin or myself can actually learn watching these things. It's, it's difficult to teach us stuff because we already know quite a bit. So that, that would be my only concern. I actually think it's people like you, Joe, that the the docuseries needs to ultimately appeal to. Well, I think that it needs to appeal to two groups. And unfortunately you and Gruskin are in neither of them, which is you need to appeal to me who knows that tennis tennis exists. And when I see the doll's face, I go, Oh, that's, that's the tennis guy, the Spanish tennis guy, Rafael Nadal. He likes clay. Um, and that I could see that and have some recognition. But what it also appeals to is casual watching for casual tennis fans. Someone who shows up and watches every major final, but that's kind of it. And yeah. when they when they watch a major final, if they're like, you know what, I consider it even most the fifth slam. 
and they watch the major final. They go, oh, who's Fritz? And they go, oh, he's an American and he's top 10. Interesting. Those people who do watch tennis, who don't have a revulsion to it or find it to be an old people sport or anything like this. But there is a, I, I think that what you'd see the most growth in just from the fact that we don't know if people like me are gravitating to it, I would wager people like that are going to love this show. They know how the score works. They know more players than I did before I watched. They're watching a lot of it live, but they don't know that much about Ayla Tamjanovic. They don't know the whole story about uh, Bedosa as a youth player. Mm -hmm. They don't know uh, FAA. They don't know his family. They don't know the behind the scenes aspect of that. They don't know that Nadal warms up so hard that Casper Ruud flounders. <laughs> I have one question for uh, for you and for the audience before I go, yeah. which is, is the second place trophy at the French Open a baking sheet? Do you make cookies? Yeah. Do you, you make cookies? You use it? Yeah, it is. Uh, we, in tennis, what, what we generally give runner-ups, as we'd call them, like either a loaf a, of bread or something? Usually <laughs> either a plate. Usually it's a plate. <laughs> or a baking sheet. It's one or the other, and it depends on the tournament, and that's that's how it goes. Uh, so astute observation to end this on. I would expect nothing less. I'm hoping that third place gets a spatula. That's all I can ask for. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Joe. See you, buddy. All right. Thanks, Gil.